Thank you. Um, I don't usually talk to uh, lay people. I'm a university professor, scientist, so I tend to talk to scientific groups. And I'll try to adjust it, but I know that you're all very smart people and can follow all of this. Um, I try to change the way I think every time I do a talk. And here I want to start off with smoking. What's that got to do with vitamin D, you may say? Well, in some ways, the history is very similar. Because this guy that we've got in the picture here, um, his name is Richard Dahl. He's one of the most famous medical scientists in England. And what he became famous for was the evidence that says smoking kills you, that causes lung cancer. And uh, he's uh, grown to a pretty ripe age. He died just a couple of months ago. And in the last uh, couple of years, he's still an active researcher, not in smoking, but the thing that interested him. He'd really like to get straight whether we can prevent old people from falling and having fractures by giving them more vitamin D. He was involved in some pretty interesting studies. And the reason I looked up his name, I thought, you know, it seems like a pretty interesting name. I had seen it in various publications. And this is one of his most famous publications. And what they did um, in 1950, one, 1951, they essentially kept track of British doctors and kept track of whether they were a heavy smoker, which is the bottom line there, or a light smoker. And they tracked them until 1991. And what this is is a survival curve. In other words, if in 1951 you were alive and you were 35 years of age, and there's a whole bunch of guys just like you, and if they were not smokers, they're that top curve that you see here in the figure. And at age 35 in 1950, they had an 80% chance of living to age 70 if they didn't smoke. If they did smoke, their chance of living to age 70 was 50%. This is a pretty good piece of evidence, but it's just one of a lot of kinds of evidence. And what I'm going to show you about vitamin D in some ways is like this. One reason why he was interested in osteoporosis, vitamin D, is the fact that bone and bone disease can do harm to you. And I just want to give you a very quick overview. This is a, a, an x-ray on the left of a hip. And the point of it is your bones are like a structural material. Nature has designed your bones so that they carry you just like a bridge and the steel in a bridge carries you. But as you get older, you start to lose the amount of material that's making your bones strong. And that depends to some degree on how old you are because your bones get weaker and weaker as you do age. It depends on your family history. Heavy people actually have better bones than light people. Perceived health. People who think that they're healthier actually have less hip fractures. Perhaps they live more healthy lifestyles and the like. But there's a key thing about this fracture, the one I'm showing you. It's the worst kind of fracture you can have. And here's why, again, the pictures here are survival curves. Okay, on the left we have women, and on the right we have men. And if you are a woman who is aged 60, the top line there, so that if, you, if today you're aged 60, you have, at least statistically, more than an 80% chance of seeing your 80th birthday. If you're a man and you're 60, you have about just over a 70% chance of seeing your 80th birthday if you're 60 years old today. If tomorrow you break a hip, the numbers change a lot. If you break a hip tomorrow, your odds of seeing your 80th birthday and you're a woman, if you broke your hip when you were 60, your odds of seeing your 80th birthday are 40%. There's a big knock, hit, bad thing that happens to your life. You know, breaking a hip is a reflection of a number of things, but generally one doesn't die of the break itself. You die of the fact that you've got to be sick and laid up in the hospital. Now, how can you prevent this sort of thing? That is what Richard Dahl was interested in. You've got survival curves, similar to smoking. And what happened was Richard Dahl wanted to find out if people 
who take more vitamin D might live longer. So they put in a grant application asking for money from the British government. And they didn't get enough for that. What they got was enough to study about 2,600 people, mostly men, older men. They, they were recruited through advertisements in Great Britain. And here's how it worked. He said, OK, I'll take part in your research, Dr. Dahl. And the main author here is Dr. Trevetti. And this was published in British Medical Journal two years ago. And what they did, they would mail you an envelope three times a year with one pill in it. So three times a year, you would take a pill. You were either given a placebo, just nothing, or you got a pill that contained 100,000 units of vitamin D. They did this to the general public. And if the, the, what you're supposed to do is if you had a health incident happen. In other words, did you break a bone or a hip? Or have, have you died? Hopefully somebody else will send the letter in. But what they f were following here is hip fractures. And you've got two lines that are going upwards over time. It's basically counting how many hip fractures happened in the group who took vitamin D and how many who didn't. The placebo group is the top line. And compared to that, the group that got three pills a year had a 25% reduction in hip, hip fractures. This is big stuff in osteoporosis. If this were a commercial product and I had a patent on it, it would be on your nightly news every day. I would be very happy to sell it to you. Problem is, this is virtually free. Vitamin D is the cheapest compound. I know Ashton had quite a few phone calls from people saying, what are you selling? We're not selling anything. This is public information, and I'm kind of pleased you know, to have the opportunity to talk to you. But I, I think you're going to find out that I'm extremely frustrated with the way that the laws are being made that determine how much of vitamins you can take, in particular, vitamin D. So here we go. What's vitamin D? Well, firstly, it's that classic sunshine vitamin. It's the thing that is made in your skin when the sun shines on it in the summertime. Summertime sun does it. The sun today, you could have gone out in your bathing suit on a beautiful sunny day. You wouldn't have made any vitamin D yet. You do not get vitamin D in vegetable material. You get it in some fish, but this is almost unique as a nutrient. You don't get much of it in the foods that you naturally eat. And lastly, some books call vitamin D a hormone. It is definitely not a hormone. Like cholesterol is, you need cholesterol in order to make estrogen or testosterone, like that, vitamin D is the raw material that your body uses to make a special hormone called 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, or you can think of it as the vitamin D hormone. Okay, you do not eat the hormone, you eat the raw material your body needs in order to make it. So the way it works is ultraviolet light, the stuff that dermatologists tell you to keep out of, is the stuff that sunscreen blocks so the skin cannot make vitamin D. Ultraviolet light breaks open a cholesterol-like molecule in your skin and it turns it into vitamin D. Another name for it is colocalciferol. So if right now you've got some vitamin D, within about three days, it would get converted into something called 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And that stays in your body for several months. For the rest of this winter, the vitamin D that you made last summer, a month ago, has got to survive you and carry you through to March. And you can get a blood test that's called 25-hydroxy-D assay, and it's paid for by provincial health insurance in most provinces of Canada. And you can get it measured, and I'll show you what you should expect to find. Now, the old story about vitamin D, the one that relates to bone disease, is that the kidney is a hormone-producing gland. The kidney senses how much calcium your body needs and what the balance of calcium is. And if you have too little calcium, it sends out a hormone into the bloodstream called 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, and it makes your intestine absorb calcium better. If you need more calcium, this is one thing that you eat where if you don't have enough, your intestines actually get better at absorbing the calcium. And it's that vitamin D hormone that does it. That's old news. 
Okay, so over the last decade or so, we've got a different story. We had that old news story about the kidney. You need calcium to get your, I mean, you need your vitamin D to get calcium. But now there's a new part of the story. Lots of different tissues throughout your body utilize that 25 hydroxy vitamin D so that they can control how they behave. They utilize vitamin D in order to send signals within the tissue to control how that tissue behaves. And some of those things that the vitamin D does, and we know it from basic laboratory research that ends up in university libraries that you never ever see. What does it do within a Petri dish? Well, what it does, for example, it helps cells to differentiate. When cells are reproducing, differentiating is a word that says that a cell knows the kind of cell that it's supposed to be in the end. If a cell does not differentiate well, it could become very easily a cancer-like cell because a cancer cell doesn't know what it's supposed to be. Breast cancer is a breast cancer cell, a breast cell that didn't differentiate properly, for example. So here's how it works. During the summer, when the sun is shining very high in the sky, what you get is the full spectrum of sunshine hitting the earth. And it's those colors that are just beyond the purple, colors that you cannot see, the ultraviolet, that are what create vitamin D in your body. Now, as the sun goes down in the sky through the seasons, when it's low in the sky, the thing that happens is we end up losing some of the colors out of the sky. Sky. Some of the colors we can't see, but those are the ones that eliminate vitamin D from our bodies. We don't get an introduction of vitamin D. From here until the end of March, you are in a vitamin D winter. You're in the dark. And you can see this change in color yourself. For example, as the sun is setting very low in the sky, you don't see the colors purples and blues anymore. You can actually see this loss of color, and some of it happens beyond what you can see. Now, what effect does that have on skin? Now, in anthropology, people recognize that skin color varies, of course. Anthropology is the study of human biology and how we developed as human beings. And there are problems. If you had too much sunshine on you, of course you know you'll get skin cancer or burned. But worse, the thing that affects your ability to have a baby is that within the blood vessels under your skin, High intensity ultraviolet light breaks down nutrients within the capillaries of your skin. The key one being folic acid. A lack of folic acid results in spina bifida and babies that don't survive very well. So what we ended up doing early on is that we had melanin. It's a dark color within the skin. Melanin protects the skin from ultraviolet light, but it also blocks the ability or slows down the ability of your skin to make this thing we call vitamin D. Now here's a map of the world. And what you've got here are lines across it. In the middle are those parts of the world where at any day of the year you can walk outside and you're going to get vitamin D through sunshine. Now, what happened over time is people migrated away from the equator and they moved either north or south in the world to areas where the sun is sometimes so low in the sky for as much as one to six months at those latitudes that I'm showing you, or for more than half the year at many latitudes in Scandinavian countries. There are parts of the year where most of the time you don't get enough sunshine outside, even on a sunny day, to make this thing. Now, down below you have something I'm going to try to show you. And theoretically, human skin colors change depending on where ancestors lived for people. Most of the people in this room, for example, had ancestors that lived probably in that no vitamin D to, for one to six months zone. How do I know? Because your skin is white. Now, where I've drawn a circle down there, that is the part of the world where the first human beings originated on this earth. And for a moment, I have to sort of separate for a second. The vitamin D story is not easily understood unless you listen to the next couple of slides. 